Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is how the hospital charge master works. Now this video is the result of viewers that specific, specifically asked me to make a video about the charge master. And much of this video is from a, a presentation that was done by Wendy Kennedy, who is a billing expert with Vitalware. She's not with them anymore, but I will leave a link in the show notes to that presentation that she made. Now, the hospital charge master is a list or a database of hospital supplies, medication, and services, like a 15 minute block of operating room time, and their associated prices. In other words, the prices that they're billing out. In other words, another name for that is their billed charges. So not the price of what it costs the hospital, but the, but, but the price that the hospital is charging Medicare or insurance companies or an individual who doesn't have any insurance, et cetera. Now, let me tell you how the charge master fits into hospital billing or what's referred to as revenue cycle. Okay, so you, you have the patient who goes into the hospital for care. It could be surgery, it could be pneumonia, et cetera. And then there's a process of charge capture. Will they capture all the medications and supplies and services that were done for that person? Now, that charge capture takes in data from a number of places. It takes it from the electronic medical record. It takes it from materials management for the supplies. It takes it from the pharmacy for the medications that are dispensed. And it takes all those charges and it puts them on a bill. Now, a hospital bill is called a UBO4, and I'll leave a link in the show notes to all of the uh, details around billing uh, as well, and then that bill is then subsequently sent to the payer. It's sent electronically these days, and then that payer could be Medicare, or it could be Medicaid, or it could be commercial insurance like Blue Cross United, Cigna, Aetna, et cetera, and then the money then goes out to the hospital, and they get paid. So that whole thing is called the revenue cycle, and the charge master is that list or that database that facilitates charge capture then being translated into the bill. Now, that database, that charge master, has various uh, columns, if you will, or different categories for everything that's done. Okay, so every single, and that could be like an intramuscular injection, it could be the administration of an IV uh, fluid or an IV antibiotic, it could be um, any number of things. Okay, so it has a department number, which is typically a four digit number. And the department could be radiology or pathology, or if it happens in the ER, then the ER would be the department number. And then it has the charge code. In other words, it has an actual, and oftentimes it's a nine digit code. It's all numeric of what the, of, of, of it's almost like the license plate for the particular service or medication. Now note, the department number and the charge code are hospital specific. So each hospital can make up their own. So they're not, you can't compare departments and charge codes across hospitals because they each make up their own numbers for that. Okay, next up, you then have the description, right? Because you can't tell from the, the charge code, you can't tell from the license plate what it is, but the description will say like, okay, you know, X-ray of the left tibia and fibula, which is the lower leg, or chest X-ray, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that description is typically only about 36 char characters long. And so many things in healthcare are very complex procedures. And those complex procedures need to be scrunched into 36 carriers. And this is why if you ever uh, request an itemized bill, like it'll have some numbers on here and you're like, I don't know what those numbers are, but then it'll ha actually have like a, a text description of what it is. And oftentimes you can't even make heads or tails of what the text description is because they've taken this long medical procedure and they've had to shorten it to 36 characters. So they use abbreviations. A lot of times they'll even just like leave out the consonants and just leave the vowels in. And so that's why if you ever get an itemized bill, it's just super hard to tell like what even the charge is for. Okay, next up you have a revenue code. Now this is where it is standardized. So a revenue code is a three or a four digit code that is then sort of, it's sort of the rolled up code. So it could be like a, um, like an ER level five visit, which is like the, the highest intensity, most complex ER visit. So there's a revenue code for level five ER visit. Okay. Now the American Hospital Association actually is the organization that comes up with all the revenue codes. Those are standardized across all the hospitals. And then next you have the CPT uh, or the HCPCS code, and that's the actual procedure code. And so here you could have a CPT code for like the actual chest X-ray or for, um, now the CPT code, let's say it's like a, for an outpatient surgery. So here the CPT code could be for like a lab 
laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Okay, so that is like a gallbladder, it's a surgical removal of the gallbladder. Okay, fine. But there's going to be different revenue codes associated with that CPT code of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, right? So there's going to be revenue codes for the OR time. There's going to be revenue codes for the anesthesia medication. There's going to be revenue codes for if they give them any preoperative medic medication or they might give them like postoperative pain medication, right? So there's going to be a whole bunch of different revenue codes for that one CPT code of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, gallbladder removal, okay? Next you have modifiers. And, and so the, probably the most common uh, modifier is if something is done on the left side or the right side. So if you have like a, a left total neuro replacement or a right total knee replacement, there's going to be a modifier that indicates if it's on the left or the right. But believe it or not, you can actually have up to four modifiers on a particular um, uh, charge. Now, and then finally you have the price. Again, that's the billed charges. That's what's being billed out. Now, if it's not confusing enough already, here's where it really gets confusing. Now, when that hospital sends out the bill to Medicare, Medicaid, Blue Cross United, Cigna, Aetna, etc., there's a... Con there there is a, a combination of revenue code, revenue codes plus the CPT code plus the, plus the modifiers. Okay, now, the different payers, in other words, the different insurance companies versus Medicare versus the different Medicaid plans, they allow different combinations of the revenue code and the CPT code and the modifiers, and other ones they'll reject. In other words, if you have certain rev codes with that gallbladder surgery, you could bill that to Medicare, and you're great, they'll totally pay. And you might do that same revenue code and CPT and send it to Blue Cross and they'll deny it because they'll say like, nope, we don't accept that. So then you change it and then you get it to go through to Blue Cross. Okay, great, super. You got paid by Medicare and by Blue Cross for two different uh, gallbladder surgeries. Let's say you have a third gallbladder surgery. This time it's for somebody with Cigna. Okay, we're like, okay, well, let's just use the same combo we use for Blue Cross. Same revenue codes, same CPT codes. Ah. It's denied by Cigna because they don't allow the same combination of revenue codes and CPT codes and modifiers that Blue Cross or Medicare does. So you can imagine that is hugely complicated for a hospital billing department to be able to navigate. Now, what happens? Okay, so fine, so they get the denial. What do a lot of hospitals do? Anytime they get a denial from an insurance company, sometimes they automatically bill the patient. This is why as the late Marshall Allen said, you should never pay the first bill. How do you know that your insurance company didn't pay just because the required revenue code, CPT code combination wasn't submitted by the hospital? You should not pay that, okay? You need to work with, or have a navigation service, work with the hospital to make sure that it gets resubmitted if necessary to actually have it go through. Just because it's denied once does not mean that you, the patient, are responsible for it. Okay, now, guess what else this presentation uh, said? It said that the hospitals themselves don't even know like the insurance companies don't even tell the hospitals what revenue code CPT code combinations they allow. They don't tell them. So the hospitals essentially have to guess and it's a process of trial and error. I mean, so I can, under, I can completely understand why hospitals are hugely frustrated with insurance carriers where for the exact same procedure, for the exact same supplies and medications that were used, they have to have individual coders code them differently depending upon which insurance it is. And if they don't get it right, they're going to get a denial and they will not get paid. I, I mean, I, this, this brings me to tears because this doesn't add value to patients at all. Like this entire process of having different combinations of revenue and CPT codes, like, it, do, it doesn't help patients at all. And if anything, it makes things worse. Think about how much administrative waste is spent both on the hospital side and the insurance carrier side going through this rigmarole in a way that adds no value to patient care whatsoever. Now, let's add another wrinkle to it. Okay, so this pricing here, how in the world does the hospital decide what that price is that they assign to each different service? Well, they can just make it up. They can assign any price they want to it. And in fact, 
Many hospitals hire outside consultants to tell them how to set those prices on the charge master through a process called strategic pricing, where what they do is they look at the patient volume and the number of procedures that they have for different services at their hospital. And they raise the prices on services that they do a lot of, and then they lower the prices on services that they, 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 they don't do as much of, so that if you average out the price increases and the price decreases, well, it looks like it's the same. It's like if you had two different gas stations where one gas station was charging $3 and another gas station was charging $5, and you'd say, okay, well, the average of those two is $4. Yes, but what if, you, if, if the gas station that was charging $5, what if they increased their, their price to six and then the one that was three decreased it to two? Okay, well, then the average between the six and the two is still $4. But what if the gas station with the $6 is the one that has all the cars coming to it? Well, then the average price of what's paid is actually a lot closer to $6 because the vast majority of cars are going to the $6 gas station. And that's exactly what strategic pricing is. They look at their services and they're like, well, we don't deliver a lot of babies here, so we're gonna lower our prices on labor and delivery. And they're like, but we do a lot of orthopedic surgery here, so we're gonna increase the prices on our orthopedic surgery. And so if you balance out the OBGYN and the orthopedic services, you're like, oh, the prices are the same. Where in fact, the actual price prices paid are much higher because so many more people were going for orthopedic services. Now a hospital down the street might do the exact opposite. They might be like, well, we do a ton of OBGYN services, so we'll jack up the prices on those and we'll have lower orthopedic services to offset it because we don't do as much orthopedics. Okay, so that is just part of the reason why the pricing on the charge master is completely irrational. And in this presentation, they even showed how when the pharmacy sends pricing information over to the revenue cycle software, over to the charge master, they'll actually list because the pharmacy actually knows what it costs them to purchase a medication, right? Because they have to purchase it from a wholesaler. They know exactly how much it costs them. And then they show what the upcharge is by the hospital. So for example, oxytocin, which is an intravenous medication that is almost universally given to women during labor and delivery. If they're having a normal delivery, typically they're given oxytocin to increase the strength and the frequency of the contractions. Okay, so oxytocin, uh, 30 units in a 500 milligram uh, IV bag, it costs the hospital two cents. And then the price on the charge master is $264. That is a 13,200X markup. Next up, propofol. That's an IV medication that is used to keep patients sedated in the ICU while they are on the ventilator, right? So it's incredibly uncomfortable to have an endotracheal tube in, and so you have to sedate the patient so they don't try to pull it out and choke on it, right? So the propofol costs the hospital 28 cents for a 10 milligram per ml, 100 milliliter vial. Then they turn around and they charge on their charge master $295 for that. That is a 1,054X markup of the propofol. And so then the hospital's like, okay, but we're gonna give the, hosp we're gonna give the insurance company a 50% discount. Oh, great. So it's only been marked up like um, 6,500 times, and it's only been marked up 525 times. <laughs> like, what a deal, right? So again, this, this, once, this, this makes me wanna cry because this adds no value to patient care whatsoever. Completely irrational pricing, if anything, all it does is it hurts people. Because then if their insurance denies it, and then they're sent the bill, and they don't have the wherewithal to actually work with the hospital to resubmit it, then hospitals used to send these bills to the local court, and the local court was actually able to garner the wages of employees. There were cases in Virginia of this. There were cases in Tennessee of this. There were people whose wages were garnered for a 13,200X markup on a medication. I mean, that should be criminal. And 
it's important for everyone in healthcare to understand, especially doctors. I was never taught this in medical school. I was never taught this in residency. I worked in a hospital that was doing exactly this. And I feel terrible about that. This is in no way acceptable. Now, I don't expect this to change overnight, but there's no way that these irrational prices on this charge master and this entire rev code CPT combination process of denials, this should not be allowed to exist. And that's my point for today. Thank you for watching A Healthcare Z.